Hello and welcome to the Daft Souls podcast. Uh, my name is Matt Lees and I'm joined once again by Mr. Quentin Smith. Video games. Video games. And special guest, Johnny... Chiodini? Chiodini. Chiodini. Oh wow, I pronounced that wrong not ten minutes ago. Oh, that's fine, most people do. I always just want to freestyle and just go and just just start doing like trumpet noises. Wow, that's... that sounds only slightly offensive and irritating. Yeah. That's why my business card has a phonetic like I'm a dinosaur. That's <laughs> <laughs> I'd prefer if it literally said I am a dinosaur. <laughs> Contact me about dinosaur-based business opportunities. Um, so yeah, what have you guys been playing this week? I have been... Uh, since I went freelance about seven weeks ago, I've been just kind of like pottering through games I know I should have played. Um, so I've got lots I should be finishing, but I've been playing Thomas Was Alone for the first time, ah. which is beautiful. Um, and it's got me thinking all about narrative experiences. Um and oh, uh, Borderlands Two finally finished it. That's another I mean, another beautiful narrative experience. <laughs> well, the Tiny Tina DLC, which is literally narrated by Tiny Tina, yeah. is utterly incredible. It's brilliant. I've heard that. I mean, I've played the first bit of that actually when I was I went to a preview event, and it was one of those things that made me. It reminded me why I love video games because it was just so silly yeah but in a way that wasn't like completely fucking stupid it was just like this is a Dungeons and Dragons campaign yeah which means it's going to have all of the stuff that Dungeons and Dragons campaigns have like when the narrator explains something and then the players go that doesn't make sense yeah and then they go oh yeah okay so it isn't quite like that <laughs> and then it gets changed like but while you're playing like mm. and sometimes it's really really obvious it's like at the point it's like oh it's a dark night it's like oh it's night isn't it and it's like oh no no it's it's not it's and, uh, and it just goes yeah. and time just fast forwards and well the interesting thing was how it changed my play style because uh, I played through all of Borderlands 2 with my friend Matt um, we started on 360 and then went to PC so we probably played about 60 hours together yeah and we've always been like oh do you want this gun it's kind of good and giving each other loot that doesn't seem fair. like yeah that doesn't seem like the attitude you want to bring to no but when it came to like uh, a and d or a tabletop kind of setting we were both like I want to be the one to kill the thing I want to do the special thing and get the special loot because it's my character and I am awesome we just went into d20 mode it's really weird <laughs> talking about I did love the fact that and it was one of those things where I was uh, I think it was a video game at the time and it was like no one else really in the office had such an appreciation of it. Chris did, I think, to a degree, but there wasn't anyone else there who really kind of came from the same gaming background of having played Dungeons and Dragons and stuff when they were younger. Yeah. Um, and the fact that when you get a chest, it actually, it rolls a D20 like mm -hmm. above the chest, like a physical D20 <laughs> spins around it and then you get a number and then the number on the D20 reflects the quality of the loot. So if you get a 20, you get amazing stuff. But it's like you're rolling for the quality of what's in your... And it's like, ah, oh, it's just like, that just made me so excited. Well, there's, like, um, there's a quest where you get a gun, which is awesome. And then um, you have to roll to pick it up. And they get each of the players to roll to pick it up. And everyone keeps rolling a one. And every time they do it, she has to come up with a different reason why it flies off. But the gun just goes, whee, to the other end of the map. And you're like, uh. And it becomes like this massive fetch quest because people keep fucking up their rolls. Because it's like they keep dramatic. Yeah, yeah. Just, just oh, it's a yeah critical fail. Ah, uh, yeah, the, the gun flies. No, it, it's nice. And I thought it actually has that one particularly has actually a really nice story. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, Borderlands Two actually, I I kind of take the piss out of it um, for not having a story, but it was actually like there were some elements of it that were quite nice. I think it's more that I take the piss out of the story in retrospect because of the fact that now they've announced that they're making the Telltale Games. Tales from the Borderlands thing. Yeah. Which I'm just like, mm, no. No, hang on, hang on. I'm listening to this. And, you know, I didn't get into Borderlands 2 because I didn't have the thing of just having someone to play with. So it felt quite empty to me just as a as a single player FPS. Yeah. But what I'm listening to you guys say is everything you have just complimented about the game is story and narrative and and everything that Telltale would be able to take and jettison all of the shooting a thing in their head. Well, no, because I think the thing is, is it's not really really the thing I mean there is like I, I, I mentioned that because it's a rarity I mentioned that the, the Tiny Tina DLC had a good nice story because yeah. the rest of them didn't like the rest of them were funny the thing is they're funny but they don't have good stories um, and I mean the main campaign of Borderlands 2 it has like a moment towards the end where some stuff happens and you gotta go oh this is a story this is alright this isn't mm -hmm. terrible uh, but it's like it's more of a surprise than anything else because okay. it's like I mean it's really funny like the DLC for Borderlands 2 what's that guy called the guy who's like a pro wrestler uh oh 
He's basically Hulk Hogan, but like... Mr. Torg. Yes, Mr. Torg. He's incredible. Yeah. He's just shouting. He just <laughs> he just shouts. Um, and because it's like, you know, you're not always talking to him. He's just on a radio with you and you're just going around shooting stuff and he's just shouting. Oh my you. God, but that's what got... Well, I mean, I actually liked an awful lot about Bulletstorm, but I love the dialogue in it, which I believe is Rick Remender. Uh, did you guys do Bulletstorm? Yeah, of course. Right. So, but yeah, just the consistent screaming and quite early on when you're chasing that woman through an area and you're swearing at her yeah. and she <laughs> is swearing back at you. And as the level continues, eventually your character is yelling shit like, dick shit, what the fuck does that even mean? <laughs> as you're shooting at each other, getting more and more frustrated until it reaches a level of self-awareness that you know the scene can't continue and something explodes and it doesn't. It's just, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really... Really funny. I mean, the thing is, he's not like the thing with talk is he does, he's not actually shouting at you. He just shouts, and the stuff he talks <laughs> about is just amazing. Like, there's a bit where he's like, he's like, do you know what's? He's like, do you know what? The only thing that's cooler than explosions being respectful to women. <laughs> this comes out of nowhere. And there's this one bit where it's just like, oh yeah, I can tell. He's like, I can tell you're a, you don't mess around. You're a maverick, but you de get the job done. The lone cop on the streets and his partner, and he just goes off and just basically describes this like entire cop series for is, about four minutes. Wait, just going into more and more detail about it. Is this part it. of the actual base campaign? Yeah, it's while you're yeah, playing. You're just happens. running around shooting stuff. It's just part of the, one of the later levels or something. No, no, yeah. it's, it's part of the deal. DLC, um, oh, okay, right, exactly. But it's, yeah, it was just so funny. I remember just, and that's that's kind of what Borderlands does best, actually, is like giving you really fun shooting shit in the head and collecting loot whilst in between just making you laugh. Yeah. Yeah, I think, like, this is, uh, obviously, I've actually played Bullet Storm and not this, but there's a thing which FPS games are now getting really good at, which is a lot of FPS games can be funny if they essentially just give you a narrator who's entirely detached from everything. Portal did it. Uh, yeah. Uh, Borderlands did it and then also obviously uh, Stanley Parable mm -hmm. like these are games which kind of chuck the slightly awkward construct like the the restrictive nature of an FPS by just having a man talking to you that's almost entirely separate from the game yeah I would love it if more games did that to be honest like because oftentimes, especially with first person shooters I mean Deus Ex Human Revolution for example isn't necessarily strictly a shooter but mm. the only people you really talk to in your ear in that way it's like fucking Pritchard it's like oh, I mean oh may I ask how it's like you're not you're just being a lazy waypoint I don't care yeah, yeah. yeah. that's the thing is it's, it's, it's entertainment and I think if you're actually going to have the kind of proper dialogue about what's going on I don't think that works unless you have super savvy fucking writing like one of the reasons I loved uh, Arkham Asylum the first Batman mm -hmm. reboot was the fact that at every point in the game Batman behaved like Batman Mm. And there wasn't a point where you go, come on, Batman, what the fuck are you doing? You're Batman. Yeah. And there was actually one point in the game when that happened, when there was a point where I was like, he, Batman was walking towards a trap. And I was there going, what the fuck are you doing, Batman? It's a trap. <laughs> this is so fucking obviously a trap. And then during the cutscene, it became evident that Batman knew it was a trap and therefore it wasn't a trap because he had <laughs> shit. And I was like, Batman. And that's why I love that game is because if you're going to have that element where the, the main dialogue and the main like kind of voiceovers and stuff in the game are just about what's happening, you have to make sure that it's sharp enough that the character is always behaving in ways that make sense. Mm. I mean, I talked about it last week. One of the most fucking frustrating things about Bravely Default is the fact that there's clearly stuff going on in the game and the characters just never talk about it. It's like there's a theme for about 15 hours of that game where it's like people keep telling you, oh, they're not telling you the full truth. You need to talk to them about this. They're not telling you the full truth. And at no point do the characters go, <laughs> listen, seriously, everyone we meet has said, you're not telling the full truth. Can we just... Like have a sit down and chat about it. <laughs> well, this is the. Just don't do it. It's, I think it's with Batman or even Human Revolution. It's it's quite easy to have a protagonist who acts reasonably in every scene, but if they are strong and silent, you know that is a, a much easier thing to convey than a protagonist who is say panicking or frail or weak. Mm. Which is, I think, I mean, a, we could turn to The Last of Us at this point and look at sort of the way they try and convey frailties, or even I mean, I suppose it's Naughty Dogs. The one thing in those games that they have consistently done is flinching when bullets are fired at you and trying to convey fear as you are crouching behind cover. Mm. But, th but these are small things. And I just think it's, it's a nightmarish challenge. I'm not wanting to take away what Rocksteady did, but I think conveying Batman in a game is a lot easier than... No, you're right. You're right. Someone who's not basically a walking statue. <laughs> 
but then I found it actually I mean just going back to Bulletstorm because I think about that game a lot mm. um, I kind of felt like in a way the swearing almost like it almost let it down because it was actually a far smarter game than that. No, I think, well, I I understand, but I mean, it was an intelligent game that had no qualms about swearing. I think if you consider swearing intrinsically dumb or like stupid swearing dumb, then that's another matter. But for me, it was just a smart game that swore a lot. Those two things aren't... I guess it was more the fact that it seemed to me like the, the swearing and that element of it was very much part of the, the marketing of the game. And it felt like, I don't know, it felt like maybe that had been included for that reason no I think I mean that, that is purely conjecture well say, like, okay this is where I get onto the f- it's an FPS you are shooting people in the head for eight hours I mean swearing yeah, yeah. seems comparatively minor like I'd much rather have a game that's said like that's advertised on like the use of the F word than here's a game where you can take out a man's skull with a hammer or like but I guess mm. Okay. Well, I was going to say my my problem with Bulletstorm wasn't sort of the swearing or anything. It was it was the fact that it wanted you to buy into the over the top bombastic violence, which was fun. Don't get me wrong, but it wanted you to buy into it to the extent where it penalised you for not constantly trying to find new creative ways well, to kill a, people. It was Tony Hawk meets FPS, right? Yeah, that, but that bothered me. Like there were times when I just like well, I wanted to get my head down and have a bit of shooty shooty. Well, okay, but and, if you want to get your head down and shoot, there are hundreds of them. But I'm not that... I'm not talking like head down call of duty shooty shooty. I'm talking about there were there were certain methods of offing people in large numbers that I liked and I wanted to go back to those because I felt like it was working for me, just in the same way that you build a loadout or like a certain number of weapons. But what did it did it do the devil may cry thing where if you do the same move over and over it becomes worth less points? Yes. Okay. But it, it remembers for like the whole time. So <laughs> after like the second level, if you whip a guy towards you, kick him, and then shoot him in the head while he's flying off. It's like, yeah, we'll give you two for that. (laughs) And it's like, okay. The Olympic judging system. I'm sorry, but I I don't feel like I have the time before dinner's ready to try and pull off this amazing Olympic gold medal winning move. It did get quite hard when it expected you to shoot people in the dick on a regular basis. I mean, you know, that was the level which I was like, do I have the skills for this? (laughs) (laughs) Am I made for this? But I don't know, I, I actually really like this. I, it was more that I think when I got towards the end of Bulletstorm, I actually realised I really liked the story. Um, and actually I kind of felt like maybe if they hadn't gone balls out... The story with, was actually with the crashness. It, it was if, yeah. if, if people haven't played it, it's a bunch of hardcore mercenaries who crash land on a planet that was meant for tourism. So it's got all these beautiful... But the planet's over on my mutants. The thing, I guess my problem really was the fact that it seemed like... I remember all the advertising campaigns for it were all just like kick you in the dick vom- characters vomiting and stuff it felt like they were very much trying to be like hey you like you like Gears of War you like Gears of War well you won't believe this like <laughs> this is like just full of like vomiting and swearing and <laughs> yeah okay well that's then the and pro- it the- kind of felt like all of because what upsets me most about Bulletstorm I think is the fact that every time I've made a video about Bulletstormer or mentioned Bulletstorm in a video saying it was an amazing game that sold really badly Everyone in the comments almost unanimously goes, I thought Bulletstorm was shit. And I think it's because the only people who played it are assholes. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel it's a real shame because of the fact that it marketed itself as quite a crass yeah. product. Like a lot of people who actually would find massive appreciation of it, like fans of sci fi, like you say, you crash land on a fucking pleasure planet. Like mm. it's got amazing yeah, it's awesome. jokes. There's one bit which is one of the funniest. Oh, are you going to talk about the bomb disarming scene? No. Oh, that's. Oh, no, you have to tell yours, then I have to tell this. Yeah, there's, there's a, a moment, like, quite early in the game, I think, where you go into a dance hall and it, it specializes in classical music. And it's like, it has a sign outside, then the finest classical music. <laughs> and because it's set in the future, you go in, the classical music, you start fighting, and boom, the lights beneath the floor kick on, and they've got a disco floor, and it starts playing Disco Inferno. <laughs> and it's the idea that in the future, like, disco is, is the genre which has been deemed to be classic <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like you know you're setting people on fire whilst it, and it's just like it's such a funny joke mm. right um, the bit that made me laugh more than I think I can remember th- that year it was the most a game had made me laugh and at a press event so I'm going to knob myself laughing in front of like 40 steely German journalists but uh, there's a bit where you find like an atom bomb type thing 
and an NPC sort of arms it and then runs away and you're trapped in a room with it. And uh, you and this other character who's been accompanying you the whole game, like, us going, oh, we're doomed, we're going to die, we're going to die. Oh my God, no, look, we can pull that vent open. You pull open the vent and you're calling through and you, the dialogue between the two of them is, ha ha, we've made it, we're going to get away, we're going to get away, this is great. And you follow the corridor as a player, crawling around and eventually you kick open another vent and land back in the same room. <laughs> and the characters just start swearing and swearing. It's beautiful. It's a great game. And I know what you mean with, it, with the way it does want you to play it differently, but I kind of felt that I like that because it, it kept me... I often find I get a point in, in most games, especially repetitive games like shooters, where I just sort of think, yeah, I'm done with this now, I just want the story to end. Yeah. And I felt like with that, because it kept giving me new weapons and almost like being like, because it stops your points coming in, I'm like, well, how the fuck do you want me to kill people? <laughs> yeah. And that means you then start experimenting with the environment and discovering new things you can do that you haven't thought of. And mm-hmm. it meant that I didn't actually get bored of the core gameplay at all. God, the term core gameplay, Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, let's, we should move on. What has yeah. happened to me? I've spent too much time in PR meetings. Maybe I'm just a person without much imagination when it comes to well, gameplay. No, maybe you're just very practical and you just shoot people in the head. And that's why you'd be the best soldier out of all of us. No, I did laser tag for my friend Stagdo a couple of weeks ago. Like, <laughs> I am not ready for war. <laughs> like, at all. I, I still have, like, I'm sorry for people listening, but that there is a blister I got from the laser gun. <laughs> from holding it? Yeah. To be fair, we were playing for two hours, but I was holding it, like, really high up. So, like, the... the underside of the handle was just rubbing on my thumb the entire time I wasn't the only one to get a blister <laughs> do you get really into it less so than others but there was a round where because it's changed a lot since we were kids guys I'm just going to I mean last that time I was about four five years ago actually no it must be more now it's about six or seven it was, I was at university okay. and that was embarrassing because okay. it's like I think of myself as not being a competitive person but it's more that I enjoy <laughs> it's more but. that I enjoy games I think yeah. I enjoy the process of playing yes. games and getting into them yeah. and so if I lose I don't mind as long as it's been fun but in that regard it was a friend of mine's birthday party at university and it was us all a bunch of third year uni students against because we did it in the middle of the day Bunch against kids. a kids party yes. yes and what was wonderful is the fact that these kids right were like terrified of me <laughs> and they I basically I was just going around like sweating balls because those you have the bloody the, the overalls it's, yeah, it's, yeah. How, it's like yeah so I was sweating my ass off running around gunning them down like, and by the end of it I was so out of breath and so hot but my score for the for the game doubled the entire of the other team's score. <laughs> and I killed them so many times. And it's great because I feel like I've planted a seed now and I'm worried that Laser Quest won't continue. Because when I was a kid, there was I went to Laser Quest and there was a guy who was called... Um, the Murderer. No, he was called <laughs> Nightlock with a K. Oh. And I remember that he was like... Some Not adult. A in he was some adult. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, just with a K. Okay. okay. No C. All right. It was the nineties. Okay. <laughs> but I remember he just absolutely. We, um, me and my friends as kids were terrified. We're like, oh my god, I got got by that guy again. Like, and yeah. it was like he was like some Jedi master, and it, he like set in fear and and like in the, the mind of a child, he was the coolest person in the world. And I like the idea that those kids will grow up being like, oh, that really <laughs> sweaty, hairy man has <laughs> killed me again. He's cool. Yeah, but here's here's the, here's the kicker: is the fact that I took my. Name from the other guy, so my name whilst playing Laser Quest is Gridlock. Oh, wow, no, that, <laughs> that is amazing. awesome. Gridlock with a CK and an E at the end. Gridlock, oh, Gridlock. Okay, okay, okay. Anyway, what did you do? <laughs> it, oh, uh, I, I did okay. Did you kill any kids? No, uh, there weren't any kids in our in our group, annoyingly. It's probably for the best because yeah. I, I did feel a bit weird when I was doing it. It was a bit strange. I felt really bad for the two people that got lumped in with a team of. 17 dudes on the same stag do they were like we, we're having fun we think how does everyone know everyone else's names <laughs> but there was one mode where it was like one shot kills but you could only fire your gun once every four seconds otherwise it would overheat so you would just pop out of cover take one pot shot at somebody and I was good at that one so I felt like a marksman but you know then I was thinking video games but apart from that no I'm not going to war it's exciting. There is, there is something about it that is like a video game that I don't think we'll ever see replicated. It's the smell of dry ice. It is. <laughs> it's just, it burns almost like it dries the back of your nose in an uncomfortable way. But it's that bit at the start, the most exciting bit of, uh, of that is the bit right at the start where you have like 30 seconds to get into positions before it starts and they're yeah. playing a siren. And it's just the running down the corridors and this panicked kind of like you feel like you're going to war. 
and it's just like it's so exciting well this is why it's awesome that we're getting tons of experimentation with like live action games like London has all the Escape the Room zombie live action role playing yeah I went to that and the, heist yeah. stuff all kinds of stuff and it's like Laser Quest but you know without the every time I've done Laser Quest I've always had the nagging feeling that the equipment is shit like yeah that's the problem there's nothing worse I've had a few games where it's like uh, you, your pack doesn't work and they give you a free game but it's like I don't want to play without my friends yeah. <laughs> like yeah yeah just wait for me out here guys I'm just gonna go in and fight these kids <laughs> have you guys done paintballing because no no because that has the more horrifying thing of like the nightlock thing where you should like me and my friends showed up and there are, are well, always kind of, yeah. there are always a couple of dudes who show up with like urban are, camo yeah, their with their own paintball uh, gun and like a, it is the scene from space where they're yeah. arming up <laughs> It's not but, a bed sit, it's a flat. Well, that's 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 fun. And there's nothing fake about being shot in the tit with a I think I just find it frustrating because it would be like the other the other guys have got more stuff than you. You feel like rushing. On it, no, it's a re- <laughs> you'll be you hate like to Russia. win basically. It is it's bloody free to, <laughs> free to play bullshit. <laughs> in fact, paintballing is the perfect equivalent of real life free to play because most of the time they get you down there by saying it'll cost you a fiver for the day or something, and then mm. it's like, yeah, well that's God, without ammo, that's lads. without a gun. Way <laughs> back in the mists of time when I was freelancing for PC Gamer magazine, uh, they sent me to look at an FPS called Quarry with a K. K W A R I, Googleable to people listening wow. to this. And Quarry was an online FPS where when you got shot, you bled money. And you claimed money back from shooting people. So imagine a kind of Quake 3 Arena type thing, but you uh, sort of have a wallet and then you can earn money. Because they were trying to get oh, in. Yeah, I remember that. On the online poker booth. I thought I remembered the name and now I remember it yeah that vanished without a trace but yeah it was funny because you go to a press event and you play the game and I played it and then they were like oh man if you were playing real for real you You would would have have made 25 pounds it's like something tells me that's garbage yeah I mean it it's funny you said they were trying to get in the online poker boom because I was going to say it sounds like the betting phase of poker cross with the raking it in at the end bit but everyone's going at once it's yeah. just stupid it's more like the end of the crystal maze where they're all trying to grab silver tickets <laughs> and it turns out they've lost everything you don't want the silver ones you want the gold ones yeah oh, Jesus Quince that's why my team lost the crystal maze <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's gone the crystal what weekend was that? thought for you there's an MMO I'm desperately trying to remember the name of Actually, I've just realised imagine that, that if VR does take off like we're hoping it like everyone wants it to, right? Yeah. Imagine it, it could mean that five years from now or less, people will be kickstarting a full recreation of the Crystal Maze. I thought you were going to say something about online gambling, but no, that would be quite the thing. Like, that's actually like not but, insane but, but, of having like old TV game shows that people want to pretend that they're on, of being like, you can be on it. Or old movies. Yeah. Or like, well, I mean, or, old, or in, in fact, movies. anything, hence, hence, you know, <laughs> VR. But yeah, stuff that would be better. <laughs> Aztec Zone, as long as that's in there, I'm happy. That was never, ever featured. Like, it was featured one in every six episodes. It was the best one. Johnny, how would you describe Crystal Maze to our American audience? Uh, it's a bit like that other one that... <laughs> Shit, hang on, what's the name? Yeah, it's pretty much perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I'll tell you a game I played this morning, actually. I played... Um, I thought I'd like to be negative, but I feel like I'll mention it briefly just because it's the one time this week I've actually had a chance to play a bloody game. Mm-hmm. Uh, I played uh, Frog Fractions. Because I played it briefly earlier, and I didn't get to the point where anything changed. And I thought, this is a bit quirky, funny, mm. slightly... Um, all right, and then realise that since then, because everyone's like, "Oh, Frog Factions Two is on Kickstarter." Yeah. Oh, imagine such a thing. You got to get money. And I was like, "All right, well, let's actually go and play Frog Factions." It's not very funny. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the thing is, like, loads of people said to me, "Oh, Frog Factions, have you seen it? Have you seen it?" And I thought I'd check it out, but it's kind of like it's kind of like the the Noel Fielding of video games. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that it just it just keeps chucking like random combinations of things at you in the idea that that will be funny. Like, oh, you're drinking a bacon milkshake. <laughs> Bacon milkshake. <laughs> no, it's a milkshake, but it says a bacon. That's it's a, crazy. It's a zeitgeisty thing, though. It's like uh, so, everyone yeah. talking about uh, goat simulator at the minute. I bought it. I played it for ten minutes before I went to bed the other night. I thought, eh, my other half is going to laugh at this. I'll play that with her, and then I'll be bored. Oh, In Rich, a year, everyone's going to be like, mm. Rich Stanton's Guardian review had the best line, which is that it's the video game equivalent of a comedy single. Yeah, of a Christmas comedy single. Yeah, he's right. I, I, I bought the game. I read his review and went, yeah, you're right. <laughs> And then went back to playing it. You know, a funny, a, a good news for funny games is that the, the Kickstarter that went up today, I think, um, which is the guy who made Space Team, uh, has this is the best pitch for a Kickstarter ever. He wants eighty thousand dollars to make to continue making games for free. 
That's all. He wants to up he wants to upgrade space team. You'll you get a badge and a patch, but it's not like pre-order a thing. It's like no, it's total patronage. He made space team. Now he he has like two other prototypes he wants to develop and give him eight thousand. That's fucking smart. And everybody, yeah. yeah. And I just it's smart. It's cool. And then so I so much smarter than bloody like I'll give you this game. But mm. then the, it's interesting though because like a lot of Kickstarters do do well because it's just a pre-order system. Yeah, but so yeah. many of them fail like because they're just like idealistic kind of ideas. Like people going, I, I want to make this game. You want to play this game? Let's do this. Yeah. <laughs> and then it's like, it gets to it and it's like, oh, we don't really know how to make games. <laughs> like, I mean, it's sad, but so many things, like some people are like, oh, I can't believe this Kickstarter's not paid out. It's like, if you funded that, you're an idiot. Like, yeah. I mean, you, you just look at the original page and you just go, come on, they had a concept artist. Yeah. Like, what the fuck, guys? Like... <laughs> What the my, fuck? My friend uh, who uh, works at a publisher had a really interesting point that when Kickstarter first came out, all the gamers were like, yeah, taking publishing game control out of the hands of the evil publishers. Then what's happening is that slowly gamers have become more and more cynical as they watch all these projects fail. And slowly every gamer is becoming just the most wizened, grumpy <laughs> publisher. I'm not going to fund this. It's not going to fucking <laughs> make nah, any nah, money. Nah, nah. That's <laughs> it. Like, it's not going to yeah. fucking... No one's gonna do it. <laughs> what's the point? No one's going to do it. That's the weirdest thing is when uh, you see something like that, that's cool, but now we're going to meet the target, so I'm not going to pledge. It's like, well, hang on a minute. If was you, that Grumpy Space you, Princess? <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm a glam fan. <laughs> Come on, that's but the Krypton Factor. That was the show I was thinking of that was like, yeah, it's hey, like the Krypton Factor. There we go. Is that a British show as well? Yes. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Use Google, American people. Um, yeah, just Google it. I think it's actually shown in America because I made a joke about the Crystal Maze in uh, Game of Thrones of Bridge, assuming that no Americans would get it, and mm -hmm. they loved it. Which oh, was good. Weird. Oh well, it's, it's extra funny if you're American because it's a niche reference, and you laugh for being smart. Mm -hmm. I think maybe. I think maybe they wouldn't get the Peter Andro one recently. Anyway, uh, we were not talking about Krypton Factor. We were talking, we were talking about, talking about uh, uh, Kickstarter. Yes. Um, the other day, like uh, Chaos Reborn, the I was looking at that today, and actually, I just I've gone a bit Kickstarter mental this week. Yeah, because I I don't know, I've maybe been thinking about it more, and I'm like, actually, you know what? I've sort of become sustainable through people kickstarting passion ideas. So I'm actually thinking like, well, no, actually, I want to make sure I spend like a bigger proportion of the money I'm earning. Every well, yeah, week, a lot of people week. on um, oh, what is it? services do that whereby they pay 10% of what they get to other Kickstarter projects. Yeah, I mean, I like I'm I'm vaguely probably going towards that now, just because I I kind of think. Hey, fuck this! I should be doing this as well. You know, it's a good thing to do. Mm. So I've kickstarted um, the reprint of Catacombs. Oh, the really? Game, yeah, because I've still got your version of it. That I haven't, you haven't played. played. <laughs> so no, wait, hang on, hang on. How does that make any sense? Well, because I, I'm sold on the concept, okay. and the reprint with the new art looks really lovely. Mm -hmm. And so I figured that I've had your copy for so fucking long, I should just give it back to you and get my get own. Your own. Yeah, and it looks like a really nice version of it. And also, it kind of like it's got like a really kind of cute. Um, fun illustration style and yeah. it seems like the sort of game that actually I might be able to get my girlfriend to play with me just because it's like a, it's because it's quite a physical game of flicking things around yeah I think she might like it so but she wouldn't get into it if it was in the original dark gothic box where <laughs> elbows point the wrong way yeah. <laughs> but yes yeah, so I did that and Chaos uh, Reborn right. just because it's like it's fucking Julian Gollop right yeah it looks great I mean I don't I don't even care like mm. it's Julian Gollop he's great and it's not he's not one of those designers like Molyneux that's just like lost his fucking mind yeah. or just gone into <laughs> cynical town and crashed his car into every child he can see <laughs> it's like you know Gollop is still good buy my amazing game that's 75% not there I couldn't believe that I actually ranted about this in the, the kind of update video I made for the Patreon page today but uh just to come out and say, like, after the alpha has been available for six months or something, for 15 quid, to say, well, you know, but 75% of the game that makes the game good isn't there. It's like Call of Duty without guns. It's like, well, then what the fuck Is are it you charging internet? 15 quid so people can play it? It's just, it's absolute bollocks. I mean, I know, I know that, like, people saying Peter Molyneux is telling Porky should not be a news to anyone. <laughs> but in the past, people have always harassed him for the fact that he has ambitions that don't get met. And I don't want to harass someone for that because I don't think there's anything wrong with that yeah. well there is but it's not the worst thing a human can do whereas now I don't have a fucking clue what he's doing but he doesn't seem good it seems like they just went we'll make a god game and then someone went uh, are you going to be more specific no, no. we'll <laughs> pick an arbitrary winner who pokes a box the best 
from the world. Do you guys um, know this? Maybe that will have the, the story idea. of how Peter Molyneux first uh, came across the concept of populace. Because he was like he was going door to door selling school books, I think. Or so he was a salesman of some. He was selling books. I know that much. And he was doing a sort of game where you had to build a town of people. And uh, he he's not he wasn't a programmer by trade, and so he didn't know how to do pathfinding. And so he was in the level editor, and and he was really he was raising and lowering ground to make sure people could get where they needed to go. And then he went ah. This is fun. I will sell this instead of putting pathfinding in my game, <laughs> and so that which I which is I'm half telling as a story that makes fun of Peter Molyneux, but half you know that's a legitimate way to. I mean, how yeah, you, yeah. I think the problem though is because I've played uh, well, I played the, the original version of the Alpha of Goddess, and it was just like it's just populous again. Like it's just making things flat. Because I played Populous about um, I think a year and a half ago for One Life Left. I was doing a like a, a spin-off show with those guys where it was like you play three games every week mm-hmm. and. It'd be like then you talk about those games, it's like a book club for games. But it meant that sometimes you play a new game, but you'd also play an old one. I'd never played Populous, got it running on my computer, had a go at it, and thought this game's bollocks. Like, <laughs> because literally, it's like all you do. The idea is amazing. Like you're a god, you must fight against other gods. What you do that is you just make everything really fucking flat. And it's like that's the optimal way to win is you win with influence, right? So it's right. a god battle, but you can't cast spells without god influence. And you make god influence by having more people. And you have more people by having bigger structures. And to get the biggest structures, castles, yeah. you need to have a large quantity of flat area. And so it ends up basically you make you just make as much flat land as you possibly can and then you just get loads of castles and then you get loads of influence and you just earthquake and volcano the shit out of the other people. <laughs> And that's it. That's the game. But it's like, the problem is, that was fun 20 years ago. <laughs> but now it's like you play Goddess and it's just like, there's no game here. This is mm. just making car parks. It's fucking Milton <laughs> Kings. Like, yeah. It's, it's uh, uh, It really frustrates me just because of the fact that like the way that they've approached... Um, and sorry, this is repeating myself if you've watched my Q&A video, but it just... It's like they're... 22 Cans and Goddess, they're approaching it like they're the fucking crazy kids with a concept artist saying, we're going to make the best RPG ever. Mm. Why is it going to be good? Because it's not going to have all that stuff you don't like in it. And then like being like, oh, actually, we don't know what we're doing yeah. when they start doing it. But these are veteran game designers. And they're suddenly being like, I mean, for, hit, for Molly to say things like, the game won't be done until players are happy. What the fuck are you making? Like, I mean, like that's not how game development works. I mean, no. it's the sort of thing that, if you're a player, that sounds amazing. What was in the middle of his cube? It was an opportunity to influence to God. Be it was God. a video of him. It was a video of him, but it was telling you <laughs> that it was your opportunity to be It's a guy God called, uh, is it called Craig? He's what? Scottish, right? Who downloaded the app an hour before... He because uh, he was like mm, oh well because there would be a rush towards the end yeah right? he said he felt quite bad about that but he still took the prize screw yeah. it but he gets to be the god in goddess actually I called that before it happened because Molly said oh it's a it's an it's a, a prize life a life changing prize that you couldn't put a value on I'm like oh you're going to be a god in your next game aren't you because that's the sort of thing that you would think we couldn't put a value on whereas I quite happily take five hundred quid instead um, <laughs> just oh, because I, I feel would, bad you for would him. wouldn't you I would I would because I know and I feel sorry for this guy because he's going to be a god in a shit game <laughs> yeah. but um oh. yeah I've been getting early access to a game which isn't shit good I've been playing Nuclear Throne oh I've been thinking about that I tell you what it's I, I on Dark Star Souls episode one I ranted about how good Luftrausers was because mm-hmm. I liked to, to rouse a lot and Nuclear Throne is just as good and the funny thing I was thinking on my way here Vlambia I first became aware of when they released Super Crate Box which yeah. is this hypertype platformer and then they've done uh, uh, Luftrausers, which is this like side side scrolly airplane thing. And now Nuclear Throne is like top down isometric shooty Binding of Isaac style stuff. They and they're all as good as one another. Like yeah. just gently flitting from genres that are similar but but different. And oh my god! And actually, what surprised me is I'm not a big fan of the kind of radioactive uh, post apocalypse stuff because it turns out I watched Mad Max the other uh, year, and it's actually <laughs> it's not. It's really interesting. Like, it's a fascinating, bizarre art direction where the chief of police is wears a sleeveless vest and is. I thought you were going to say it was plants. bad. Then I was going to have to like fight you. No, no, it's amazing. Mad the Max gang, is brilliant. The gang is like this weird omnisexual group who like, you know, like destroying. Co- very, very, very creepy film. Mm. And uh, to to say that like Fallout or something is inspired by Mad Max, it's like that's tremendously disrespectful to Mad Max because well, just the took, first film anyway. they just took the clothes exactly, exactly, <laughs> and Australia. Yeah. They took the clothes in Australia. 
Anyway, so I'm not a big fan of radioactive post-apocalyptic stuff, but Nuclear Throne, I should have just trusted Van Beer because the texture of it is all weird and skewiff. Like, when you first start, the main menu is just a campfire with all the playable characters set around it in a randomised order. Great. And, like, the first one you select is, like, a fish, and as you click on them, they all sort of do stuff, but it's, like, indie guitar music playing, and the fish is the one playing the guitar, and then when the game starts, they go off on their nuclear rampage, and there's just gently the sense that they're all a bit tired. <laughs> like, the soundtrack isn't just rock and roll. It's got an element of, like, sadness. It almost sounds like the village music in the original Diablo, if you remember Tristram, the kind of yeah. mournful guitar. There's a touch of that to it. And on the upgrade screen where you level up, it's like there's... this. The, the entire game is encapsulated in that one of the powers is called, like, shotgun or shell fingers. And it's a picture of your character looking at their hands and all of his fingers have been replaced with shotgun shells. <laughs> and it means that when you use a shotgun, the bullets bounce more. But the character's face is, like, really sad that his fingers are shotgun <laughs> shells. And that sort of sums up the game. It just sort of... It's not quite what you expect, but it is so tight. The shooting is That's so the thing good. Is, I think what I respect most about... Uh, I haven't played it yet, but I, I was reading an article about it and just the way that they're, like... The way that they're approaching early access is amazing. Uh, they've actually bumped the price up and been like, it costs m more to get into early access than it will to buy the final game. Okay. And that's because they don't want the majority of people playing the early game. Mm -hmm. They want people who who love it and are really committed to it. To who will actually it. provide the feedback. Yeah, they want they people want, yeah. who are going to keep playing it throughout the whole period, who are going to be fanatical about it, who are going to give them feedback, who are going to help them shape the game. Mm. But they don't want... And that's the thing is, I get the impression with like fucking Goddess where he's just saying, oh, we want you all to shape the game. And actually, it's like, no, you just want a fucking free QA team. right? Whereas with what they're doing with Nuclear Throne, it's like they've kind of purposely said it's more expensive than it will be when it's out. Uh, but that's because we don't want people to buy it and we're not going to put it on sale. We don't want people to like stumble into it and play it on finished because they want the majority of people to have the finished experience and that's why they've made it more expensive and it, which is crazy like you know but it's 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 even the way they're implementing it like from the main menu like there's a list of changes i think it's the main menu you can just see like we have added this we have done this and it's very much like you can watching the game be developed is almost like receiving a little micro DLC pack. I think they've been they've been streaming like on Twitch they've been streaming the development of the game yeah oh, right. like they've actually been like just having like really no, they're they showing people how it's happening. Tremendous. If you've met any of them in real life, well, it's mm -hmm. Rami who does a lot of the talking, but uh, there's a lot of good, really talented people, and they're just very cool, very smart. Like, and they work hard, you know? Mm. Yeah. They came back, obviously, from the whole ridiculous fishing, ninja fishing saga. That was them. If um, Yeah, I remember. They just basically getting their game cloned. Their game got cloned and sold massively, and then they sort of... And they persevered. They, they went away. They sort of, like... They, had, they worked with Zach Gage to have this amazing new art direction. They finally released their not-a-clone, like, months later and because they made it it's like oh you're going to clone us well we're just going to be so fucking good yeah <laughs> you cannot clone and then sure enough their front page of the app store they sell a lot they win awards and then they go and make nuclear throw they're just a powerhouse well, that's that's but they do pride themselves uh, pride themselves rather on, on delivering things that are complete and that just work because I think with a lot of Steam Early Access games um, oftentimes the the community aspect and the fun you can have playing it is greater before the game is fully released than afterward. Like the most interesting stuff that's been written about DayZ has been like before it even was a proper, you know, even when it was as a mod and then it was in the very early phases of early access and now everyone's kind of already bored with it. So yeah. once it finally comes out, people will review it but they'll be like, eh, this isn't a special thing well, that's evolving that, I anymore. I think that's unfair, you know? I mean, I get, I get, it, it's unfortunate and that mm. just, it's sort of, it's a problem with the video game press, I would argue, more with, more than with the game. Yeah. If, because we are always excited about what's new, that's what makes our jobs easy, it's what sells, you know, advertising space, it's what gets traffic. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you know if a game so we can get early access to something that isn't finished of course we're going to look at that and of course we're going to be less interested by the time it comes out but that doesn't mean it's less interesting as an object but I guess I, I just mean to, mm, well I guess because the community is, is discovering things in like an imperfect world as it grows there's something fun about that that it's like being a frontiersman. More, yeah, exactly. You know, there's a, there's a sense of discovery and it feels like your experience grows with I the guess game it's, itself. I guess it's the equivalent of like playing Dark Souls um, without knowing much about it, you know? Which is what, what I did when I first played it. And then, But then if you play it, like, I mean, even with all the messages and stuff, I kind of feel like maybe if you played it about 
a year later. Like it will be a different game because of the fact that there's a sheer number of messages that have become permanent that almost act as like consistent guidance. Hmm. Whereas like in the early stages, it's it's massively slapdash and just some stuff that just isn't true and some stuff that just doesn't. I mean, that stuff does remain, but it's something about... And that's one of the things I find frustrating about any games with online components, actually, is that feeling that you have to be there when it starts, otherwise you're going to miss the experience. Yeah. You know, it's funny, uh, the one time I've experienced that and will be like, oh, you had to be there, was World of Warcraft. Yeah. Did you guys play um, uh, or early back in the day when Booty Bay was still... So Booty Bay now is, I believe... Oh, I forget. It's either purely Alliance or purely Horde, or you can all go there, but you can't... I remember what it was both. Other. Exactly. So back in the day, it was both, and it was a no man's land. It was the one area which wasn't like before they introduced battlegrounds. And yeah, where parts. it was. So it was just like the Wild West town where you'd walk in and look, and there's an alliance member right there, and neither of you quite attack each other. And it was before they took language out, because back in the day, if you as an orc talk, and an alliance member would see that on local chatters, and yeah, I all that. the races had randomised things so they all sounded different. But yeah, then eventually, which was a bizarre, like, it's like playing Red Dead Redemption online, mm. whereby it's like, is he going to shoot? Oh or, my God. or Daisy. I love, I fucking love Red Dead Redemption's um, online multiplayer. It's just brilliant. Yeah. It's, it's a sort of the hidden best component of like GTA and Red Dead Redemption. But again, another frustration is like, yeah, I, I played that tons yeah. in the first like month of release. Yeah. And now I think you went on, I don't yeah, know. It don't would know. be a ghost town. Yeah. That's the thing, it's, it's really frustrating. It's like, you kind of feel like a lot of time if I miss something, I don't feel like I'll never, I'll never be able to go back because it won't be the same. Mm. You need to but get you don't in. know if the game's moved on. It's partially in your own head that, that these games it does though because I mean it's stuff like remember things like GTA for example like GTA 4's multiplayer was quite fun for a few weeks and then it just became like yeah just, roving gangs of yeah mm. like it just the, the, the it never works unless unless it's gives, given continued support and games that have I think it's this weird transition we're in where like now I kind of respect games for Titanfall for just being like it's an online game yeah. Like in a way of being like rather than trying to do this because the whole single player game with a multiplayer mode I think is the sort of thing in about 10 years time we'll tell people about and they'll be like what? Why? Like, yeah. like they'd spend like millions of pounds making a mode that people would play for a month and then <laughs> never play again yeah. like, I think that's something that history will judge quite ridiculously yeah that's a good point I think that'll always be real if you the lion's share of work will go into developing sort of the body of a game so I think it makes sense to like have a single pl- well, it makes comparative sense to have a single player mode in a multiplayer game or vice versa purely because the lion's share of the work is already done and you can probably sell more copies Yeah, like I would bet I mean think about how many people buy Call of Duty and never touch the multiplayer or how many people for whom the multiplayer is all that matters that's an example of yeah. a game I mean, massively you're right you're right and I mean I, I, I wouldn't I, I, very I, I really like your point though and I, and I no no think I think I think true. the thing is I think it, that's something that will be true soon but I, I would I would very much put money on the idea that Respawn because of their position within EA and because of how they got to EA that they basically went we're not doing it we don't mm. want to do it so we're not doing it I would I would very much think that that is not so much a case of times have moved on but them throwing their weight around because they have weight to throw around you know yeah. uh, but I don't think we're quite there but I think we're moving towards it and um there is very much a case of lots of games like even Daisy. I sort of feel like oh, if I'm not gonna, if I'm going to get into it, I've got to get yeah, into it, it soon. Now. Yeah, and I don't have time, and it's annoying because I'm like, oh, well, I, I still I love falling back on single player games because I know that like I still haven't fucking played The Witcher two, mm. but I'm always glad they've pushed back The Witcher three till 2015 or whatever because yeah, like, it's like Ace that gives me another year to play The yeah. Witcher two, well, like, and just, I'll need a year. <laughs> <laughs> I just started playing the first Dark Souls for the first time. And I am so shit at it. And I know everyone, like, at the first time, it's like, everyone tells you you're going to die a lot. But I'm, I think I am, like, I was about to say something really offensive, just really supernaturally shit. <laughs> like, you know, you get past the, the asylum and you get to, like, the filing yeah. shrine. There we go. Um, the first two enemies you, you meet are skeletons. No, uh, no, 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 <laughs> no. Okay, because they are fucking me every you've, single you've time. You've fallen into that, but this is the thing. Uh, <laughs> the wonderful thing. This is the wonderful thing about Dark Souls that I think I, I, I'm enjoying Dark Souls too. But okay. I, I think it's a fun game. I think it's better than most games. But I don't think it's a masterpiece in the way Dark Souls is. Okay. And the way Dark Souls is amazing is because of that. Is because you come out and it makes you naturally think. And there's a fifty-fifty chance you might not have done this, but there's a fifty-fifty chance that you'll think the 
first area of the game is the graveyard. <laughs> yeah. And the graveyard will fucking destroy you. Yes, it does. Because it, it does that thing. And this is why I didn't get on with Skyrim, which came on at the same time, with that uh-huh. whole auto level. You can go wherever you want and everything will be perfectly tailored to be difficult just enough yeah, for yeah, you. Yeah. I was like, that's fucking boring bullshit. Yeah. Because what I love about Dark Souls is it starts you off like 25 feet away from things that will murder you. Right, like, yeah. So hard. Oh my God. The um, So before Dark, before Dark Souls, there was Demon Souls before Demon Souls from software made a series called yeah. Kingsfield. Yes, the first Kingsfield back on PSX uh, when you wash up on a boat, you're on the shores of a big island, and these are FPS games, uh, like they're first-person RPGs. But mm. aside from that, they are they share so much of the DNA of Demon Souls. If you turn right, you will find an entrance to a dungeon that eventually leads you through some slimes to a village. If you turn left. There is an octopus the size of four houses, and it's just <laughs> on the beach, sort of floating its arms around. And if you walk towards the octopus, you can. Do you want to get? You can guess what happens. You die. You die immediately. <laughs> and there, I don't even think there's a way to kill it. But it's just that's like that's... A, he is an enormous two-story high signal. <laughs> that's the kind of game you're playing. Yeah, yeah. and that's it. Is it basically the, the introduction that, that people get freaked out by the tutorial because it's quite hard? But then actually, the real introduction is the graveyard because yeah. then it's basically it's like. Yeah, this is the kind of game we are. We're not going to give you... There's not going to be any signposts. Nothing's going to pop up on the screen and say, you're not supposed yeah. to be here yet. Yeah. And basically, you know, the thing is, it, because it lets you go there, it's cool, because there's yeah. actually some good items there. If you run past all the enemies, you can get some good items in there, right. but you don't want to fight them, because they will fuck you. Okay. Importantly, sorry, this yeah. is this yeah, is yeah, the way... The, the, what you're doing right now is you are playing Dark Souls. Yeah. Like, the, talking with your friends and having your friends guide you and having players online guide you, that is the game. It's uh-huh. not meant to be played by yourself. Well, this is the thing when I've been playing it, because I've about three times now since I got convinced that going through the graveyard was the way, and I was just convinced that I hadn't got the hang of the combat properly. I've gone in three separate times, died about close on a dozen times each time, and every time I've gone, oh, I'm, I'm going to be playing you properly one day, Dark Souls. <laughs> I'm going to be up and running, and I can't wait. I feel like is, I need somebody to mentor me for an hour, and then I'll be No, 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 because you you, uh, talking to people, just getting easy information, like, don't do that. Yeah. Like, that will help, because now what will happen is you'll go a different way, you'll find a different way to go, and suddenly you'll be like, this is so much easier. Or you'll find yourself facing ghosts, in which case you've gone the wrong, wrong way. <laughs> Run the fuck away. Okay, fine. But it's it's like, I don't know, what I like about the fact that it gives you that option is last the last playthrough of Dark Souls I did mm-hmm. on PC, I don't think I finished it, but I decided, uh, I started at the Firelink Shrine after the tutorial, and I went to the Catacombs first. And it was like, just because I knew I could, just because I knew yeah. I was good enough at the game and understood the game enough, I'm like... I know that I'm not supposed to go to the graveyard because it's really hard, but I can do it. Yeah. I did. And I went through and I like killed Pinwell as my first thing. And it's like, oh wow, right? really? Yeah, because you can do it. Like, if you know what you're doing, it's not that hard because Pinwheel as a boss is actually very easy. It's just the skeletons. But then obviously you realize you go on that skeletons aren't actually a risk. And the only reason they keep coming back to life is because there are pyromancers. If you kill the pyromancers, no more skeletons. <laughs> anyway, hmm. I mean, the thing is, I, I, I want to talk more about Dark Souls 2 because I, I'll very briefly, and I'll be cryptic again because I know people appreciated the crypticness in that last time, but my god last time I was talking to you Quinns you basically hinted to me that I should go to a certain area um, you were no, like, no we, we can say that we I can, mean yeah you said can... you said to go down the well you in were like the, in the middle of Medulla there's a well in the middle of Medulla and it's kind of like a big drop but you can get down and he was like yeah you should inv- think about investigating that soon and I was like alright yeah I'll think about investigating that soon and then what I found down that well turned me into a monster <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and then I spent about well, actually, most of the last weekend being a monster. I had a great thing where um, lame. No, not lame. lame. <laughs> Incredible. I just don't get Dark Souls yet. There's a. I had a Friday. I, I can't remember if I said this in the podcast, but I had a Friday night. I, I always play a very nice man in any game, and then Dark Souls two. One Friday night, I was. Um, uh, in a mood that wasn't even bad but I wanted to, to, to mess with some guys because I hadn't been inna- invaded enough in Dark Souls 2 so I just spent the evening invading people like six, seven people and my thing was walking towards them as slowly as possible and pointing a lot and then walking some more and pointing <laughs> uh, and generally trying to be the T-2000 um, 
from Terminator 2. And uh, that was fun. And then I, after it, I knew there was all this weird junk in my character to do with being guilty now, but I'd found the secret character who cleanses you of your sins. <laughs> and I had a great, I laughed out loud at my, at my screen because I found him and I went to the attic where he lives. And he said, brother, do you want to be cleansed of your sins? And he, he hadn't even offered me that before when I talked to him, so I knew I was in the right place. And I go, yes. And he goes, are you sure you want to be cleansed of your sins? And I got the yes no dialogue box. I'm like, oh shit. Yes? And he goes, all right, 136,000 souls. <laughs> and I went, what? That's a lot of sin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't even kill that many people. But it's like, uh, it's like people who were mad about Bioshock's ending. It's like, how many little girls did you think you had to kill to be evil? Yeah. So basically, the, the, what I've been doing, I'm not going to go into any detail on this because it will be, because I'm doing this little video series of me kind of recording diaries as I'm playing and capturing where I'm at at that point. Fragments of innocence. Yeah, yeah, which is interesting because I think I was talking to you about this the other day, like most people like, I feel they have to be right in videos and I'm quite enjoying being wrong. The only difficulty is then I have hundreds of people telling me things that I now already know. Mm. And they're like, <laughs> oh, you didn't get this. And I'm like, no, I know, but I know that. I've known that for about three weeks. I just purposefully left it in a state where I didn't know what I was on about because I thought it would be more honest but people don't really get that because it's yeah. not something people do on YouTube yeah. but hopefully I'll get around to it but um, yeah I, it's this opportunity you get basically because I've never been into the PvP but there's an opportunity you get to do PvP that isn't fair for the other people mm. and basically you get the opportunity to basically fuck with people in a way that's just heavily unbalanced towards you right um for your personal game there's actually the, all the covenants are now really interesting and do really cute stuff yeah i don't know if they've expanded as as much as they could have done but it's still really really cool but this whole thing is just i got into it in a horrible way because i've never liked the idea of doing what you were doing and just invading people and fucking with them and then killing them but for some reason invading them and fucking with them and killing them where the odds are against them even more than usual I really like <laughs> and funny that I don't know why I mean I just got hooked to it and actually I'm not, I won't go to the full depths of it but there's, there's there was one element of, of me that I was just end up doing something that I didn't need to do that wasn't even part of the game and just, just to really fuck with people even further and I think it was something the game was encouraging me to do and that's something I'll definitely talk about when I eventually I, I don't want to spoil it more but watch the video if you want to know but I'll tell you guys afterwards but I really don't want to spoil it because it is amazing this whole area and this whole the way it unfolds and the way it happens is just brilliant but I love it's such a genius idea because it's like I think the reason I like it is the whole thing about Dark Souls that's amazing is the fact that you feel like the odds are stacked against you and you feel like the game's trying to fucking break you oh yeah. so this is your opportunity to fuck with someone else it's my it's, it's me making that for them because I think well, that's Souls, why I invite yeah. people but the thing with that area you're talking about is that's the area where it happens I like invading people because they don't my, know it's going to happen yeah because in my play I just I want to be that guy I get it now I want to be the guy who when you're on your trip back to recover 25,000 souls from outside the boss arena just, I want to be the guy who stood between you and that and because if I beat them, that's fun for me, and it's it's dramatic for them. But also, it gives them the opportunity to beat me. And yeah. if they do, then I know that that will be the best moment in their game. Yeah, mm. no, you're right, and that's why I like doing it. It's that occasionally these guys get past, but regardless, like it will be a story. And I've had some people who I had one guy who was so close to getting away. Like he was so close to getting away that I thought he got away, but then he didn't. <laughs> and it was horrible because it was literally like, I know that it would have been like, I've done it. I've done it. I got past him. I got away from him. I got away from him. Uh, and it's like last minute. It's like horror movie shit. Like, no, you didn't. <laughs> now you're dead. And I'm, I, I don't know. I spent an entire Saturday doing it and it, it it gave me such a thrill. I was trying to explain this to my girlfriend who doesn't really play games and she just looks at me like I was insane, but I got such a kick knowing that there were people all over the world who would be going, fuck! Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> fuck! Because I, I really screwed them over, yeah. like, so hard. Um, and I like that. I like the idea of having a game of being like, especially the way they've done that, of having sections in the game where it's like, well, now you're going to have a challenge that is going to be partly controlled by a human. And they did that in Demon's mm. Souls. There was one of the bosses was... Um, was if there were any players available would be a human instead of you finding oh wow somebody uh, with patterns and but obviously the problem with Demon Souls and Dark Souls was the netcode was garbage where they've mm -hmm. actually kind of fixed it a bit more now so this stuff just sort of works mm -hmm. a bit better but no I mean it's 
it's very good and I, I really worried about myself though because I did become like a terrible human being there, there's a lot of pleasure in that I mean griefers are nothing new and I'm not necessarily but I've, I've never felt you. of myself as being a griefer yeah, but and yet now I am no, the just reason finding that one game that lets you be a griefer in a way you're alright with the, like one, in, the thing that Matt and I do have in common is that we both were being as theatrical as possible in our griefing like really dramatic stuff like our friend Brendan says that, that like nobody really minds being killed in dramatic situations in DayZ but the thing that the entire community hates and it's the same thing weirdly mm -hmm. people hate it in World War 1 World War 2 snipers yeah like if you just get shot and you don't know where it came from that's just rude <laughs> uh, sorry what were you going to say I interrupted you uh, I was going to say uh, well I did most of my griefing in um Again, Red Dead Redemption multiplayer, where it would respawn people. Like if you caught somebody in the open plane, where you'd like when you crested a hill on your horse and shot them, it was great. And then it respawned them there again. They were like, huh? and you gave them a few seconds to run, and it was like, nah, still going to plug you in the back. But um, actually, what you were just saying reminded me more of when uh, when I've uh, I was playing Halo Three. Like I play that a lot, like uh, offline split screen multiplayer with my friends. Um, and because it was my Xbox, like generally I would be better than other people and killing them in ways whereby like it, it felt cheap to them for a second before they realized it in their kind of like careful positioning and running around. I was just walking behind them for about 25 seconds <laughs> and it's like just kind of giggling. They're like, why are you giggling? I don't know. And then you beat them to death and then just kind of walk off as long as I think you're right. As long as there is an element of drama, even if it's very well, one-sided. I was, I was creating like all sorts of horrid drama in these you know, like scenarios. It mm. was just like, just a fear element. I, I love the fact that because the, the thing is when I first entered this area it happened to me and I didn't have a fucking clue what was going on I was like what is happening and it happened to me and I got killed and I was like what the fuck was that <laughs> and then and then when I realised what it was when I got the opportunity to do it I relished it even more uh -huh. because like, I, I just I, the thing is I actually maxed out that covenant as well which means I killed 35 people in that way which is like do you get a reward for doing that yeah yeah you get quite a nice ring uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I I, I, like, there are some expendable items you can get which kind of a bit pointless apart from fucking with people in PvP that you use this item and it turns you into a piece of like um, environmental oh okay so I basically use these items in this thing and it means that people run into the room and they just run past you because you're just a little statue yeah Like, and it means when you're using that you can move around but you just slide in that weird way like, <laughs> so you can be a chair that's just sliding <laughs> and it is literally like musical chairs not musical chairs they're like um, what's it called that wolf game uh, oh, oh look, god what's the time Grand, Mr. Wolf? Grandmother's Footsteps uh, both uh, variations both. on the same gameplay format yeah <laughs> <laughs> but it's that thing of basically being like they just walk into the room and they look around don't see anything and they just walk past you and then every time they're not looking you're just sliding <laughs> kind of <laughs> and just waiting and just, just waiting and waiting and waiting are until... there any tells because like in no. is, is it in Demon's Souls or in Dark Souls we can see some of the chests breathing before they then attack um, no with this there's no tell other okay. than the fact that if you know the game mm -hmm. you'll be like that isn't there like if, you, if, if that's why right. there's, a, there's a degree of being like um, because it turned me into a statue and it meant I kind of made sure that when he came to the room I was in a position where it looked like there might be a statue like right. it didn't look odd yeah because if you're just in a weird place then people are like what's this about like, yeah. so you have but to there's look. something to be said for them entering a room and seeing a statue by itself in the middle of the room in a spotlight <laughs> that's the thing them. that's the thing if, if you, but that's it if you were in the middle of a spotlight then they might be fearful of it but they would also think it was level design so there's a degree of being like making sure that you always stop in a position where it looks like it could be level design yeah because otherwise a smart player will work it out it's funny that we're talking about this as if it's like a really innovative like amazingly executed thing when Assassin's Creed's been trying this in multiplayer for like four games now Assassin's Creed multiplayer is a th hell of a <laughs> thing but it's bizarre oh, like it's, oh, it's just broken I in mean, a really charming way it's it's really rapid aggressive sprinting murder hiding it's it's very strange I've heard it's more like long game of people trying to pretend to move like yeah NPC. exactly like no, you're trying to move, but, but, it, but that's what you're supposed to do that's what the game has been screaming at you to do for the last iterations which is why so was, I haven't played it but I know that's what you're supposed to do every single time I've bought a new Assassin's Creed game I've gone into the multiplayer and played a game as a level 1 against people like level 15 who are just doing the Call of Duty 
Duty theme running around on rooftops and killing people oh. and getting a lower rating and wandering around as an NPC and shanking the right people in a subtle way puts you right at the top of the leaderboard. So I've come first every single time and gone, yeah, that's still kind of broken because you can't fix player habits in that way. No, you, you but, can try and encourage people to play. Oh, God, yeah, did, you exactly. guys, did you guys play the ship? That was a thing. It was a, no, I, I know about it. A, a, just the, I, me and my friends played it before it was a commercial release. With uh, well, the thing, by the way, I was going to say is that yes, these games like have their multiplayer, you know, sort of lost. But what, whether it's Daisy or the ship, you can always recreate it by just getting a bunch of friends together and creating your own server. And mm. Daisy doesn't require that many people if you agree to play in a certain area, for example. Anyway, uh, but no, yeah, the ship was this bizarre thing where everybody's walking around and you have a target, but no one can see you kill them. And it led to just some of the funniest shit. Like, because you had the only, you couldn't just hide in a safe place because you had to eat, you had to sleep, you had to go to the toilet. Just insane stuff where you'd look over your shoulder and you'd see a character at the other end of a corridor and they'd see you're looking at them and they'd just slide <laughs> away. And you, so you quite clearly know who's on your back. And then the whole thing, the whole time you're being really clever, really clever, and he can't possibly kill you, can't kill you. And you go and you sit on the toilet and you're taking a shit and then you're looking and the door opens and a satchel of C4 just slides in and you're like, fuck, and it takes you out. Uh, but yeah, just the funniest thing. And then they made the commercial release and yeah, player habits just, yeah, just destroyed it. That's the thing, it's difficult. And that's why I kind of like... And that's why I enjoy things like this in Dark Souls 2 because it doesn't give the other person a choice. Yes. It's very much like playing a, like an RPG. It's like you're the games master. Yeah, like it's you, Easter egg game. It's more. your game and mm. like they have to play by your rules. And there's something really fun about that because one of my favourite things I've noticed in these areas is uh, as with any PvP in, uh, in Dark Souls, it seals off the area with smoke. So it means that then they can't leave the area until you until the fight is over. To, yeah, yeah, until you've either killed them or they've killed you. Yeah, and so it, the, the wonderful thing is just just hide it. I never I never present myself immediately. I always wait until I'm going to appear. So it's part of a dramatic kind of thing <laughs> of being like, "Hello, there's another human here. Hello, it's me." Um, but I just love it how sometimes you see people just. Brass as bold as brass, just dashing out, running, and you think, okay, we got a runner here, we got a runner, <laughs> we got somebody who's going to try and try and get past me without fighting, and that's a different sort of technique. But sometimes the funniest people are the people who just come out into the room, look around, and then just start trying to go back. <laughs> they're, like, they're just like people who just go, and then it's that's great because you just watch them like going back to the, the smoke wall and being like looking at it and then coming out <laughs> wow. and then going back again, and it's people just going, and I can tell because I've been that person, and them just going. What's going on? I want to get out. How do I get out? And it being like, you can't get out. And that's when I'm like, oh, I'm going to have a lot of fun with you. <laughs> so yeah, I, I learned through Dark Souls 2 that I'm a terrible person. So if, if anything, just for that, I, I thank them mm. um, for, for revealing my inner demons. Um, let's have some questions at the end. Um, Void, aka Green Mushroom. Is it worth to get into the Ace Attorney series? Ye you both looked at me I'm like maybe <laughs> the games are they're very frustrating I've ever, as I understand them sequential releases have become less stupid but which is I got in there right at the beginning and that central mechanic is great the courtroom and you have to pick where someone's statement is a lie and then present them with the evidence but the puzzles just didn't hang together it was intensely frustrating and so I've been turned off later versions but apparently they're really strong now and Ace Attorney versus Phoenix Wright is no, Ace Attorney versus Professor Layton. I, I think I got annoyed with the fact that I loved the first one, but it was, as you, as you say, some of the puzzles were like bullshit. Like, how the fuck was I supposed to work that one out? Yeah. It's like you're trying to reverse uh, Jonathan Creek. And you have to do the whole scene again if you... Yeah, that's horrible when it's like you guessed wrong too many times, you have to do the whole thing again. It's like it's like having to, it's like somebody saying, oh, you know, you've, you've left the room when the last five minutes that TV show were on, so you have to watch the whole TV show again. Yeah. It's like, what? What? Um... But then the problem is they've, they've improved on that in the later series, but they've also they have done that classic sequel thing of having to add something new. And it's invariably like, one of them you've got a girl who can read auras, mm. one of them you've got someone who's psychic, and it's just like ghosts. It's like, fuck off. Like they had, they had the formula right. Yeah. And then they kept toying with things. Like I think in the, 
In the DS version, there was like some items that were 3D that you could turn around and investigate. And oh, stuff. to notice mm. mistakes or like weird notches on them. Yeah, you could like basically whenever you got evidence, you would have this thing where you could zoom in and you could properly inspect evidence in 3D. That's okay. That's awesome. Like, oh I, right, he's, that one's allowed. <laughs> that's the thing is though, I just sort of I don't know. I, I like the fact that it was like silly characters, silly crimes, but it was still all kind of forensic based. No, it was cool and it made you feel very smart. Uh, so I don't know if it's worth getting into the series, but for sure, pick up maybe the newest one or one of them don't worry about the in jokes because it's a dumb game anyway and have fun see if you have see if you have fun for my two cents never played ace attorney but professor layton is very good i've heard he's a nice man he is i don't know i like professor layton games but it really fucked me off with the way that (laughs) there would be this degree of like half the time I finish a puzzle right and it would be that thing of me sitting on a train with the notepad and paper and I love that I love that it's yeah. a game that forced me to actually make notes Yeah. and I'd be trying to work out a puzzle and 50% of the time it'd be like I'd make all these notes and after 20 minutes I'd go I got it and I'd type it in and I got it and I felt like a genius yeah. and then the rest of the time it was a trick question and the answer was one or a cat yeah that and was it, rare you're a mean man no but it annoyed <laughs> you're me a so star. much it annoyed no. me so much when there were, there were a couple that were like bullshit trick questions that had me like scratching my head doing maths for ages the and best like, was yeah, um, just one <laughs> oh. it's like those dickheads who tell you like they do puzzles and they're just like trying to trick you like, like the, the whole a man goes into the hospital press the lift button and then kills himself why that kind of shit yeah like, and it's like there's something you, you should have it's, noticed it's but a it's stupid like... lateral thinking puzzle that doesn't make sense yeah the best was uh, my ex was playing it and she was stuck in a puzzle and it was like where should this man put the corks so that he doesn't smell this horrible smell and it was all winding chemistry sets so Brilliant. you had to follow the tube and all the gas leading through the tube and you'd think and there were all these outlets so you think oh, I'll put the corks in one of one of the outlets which one is it of course the correct answer was to tap on the man's face and the corks go up his nostrils yeah <laughs> There was another one with like, you are in a dark room, you want to cook some dinner, you have only one match, a gas stove, a lantern, you like the a match candle. First. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's classic though. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that was fun. I, say, I think sometimes they were fun, but I think it was mainly because in the first one I wanted to finish it and like so many of the puzzles in the first half of the game were so inventive and then towards the end it was like, uh, it became like kind of bullshit riddles and stuff a bit more yeah. often because it felt like they were running out of steam yeah like when you're in the sewer and the game randomly was like oh this one's critical by the way so if you don't complete this one specific puzzle you're, you're not going to get past this bit of the game yeah like, the first why? game yeah it happened in the very first one I think they've become a lot stronger mm. in later ones I think oh man let's try again because to be honest one thing I loved about the first Professor Lane game is the story was kind of beautiful yeah. and it really blew me away because oh my god the animation is gets better and better throughout well, it was just the series a, it was the tone of the story because I was like you're following this mystery and you have no idea what's going on and it's all about looking for this golden apple and then when you get to the truth of what the golden apple is and what's going on in the town it was really heartbreaking it was uh, genuinely like kind of like beautiful little story and that very Ghibli-esque yeah it was mm. it was like wow that's really touching anyway so yeah um, play b- both <laughs> yeah, yeah. pick up an Ace of pick up a Phoenix right for Place. fuck's sake I did it again <laughs> pick up a Professor Phoenix whatever. Pick yourself, next question pick yourself up a Professor Phoenix <laughs> we that. won't raise an objection <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, immaculate sandwich otherwise known as I can't even see it that's a great name uh, I've recently played Earthbound on a SNES emulator what is the most daring slash illegal thing you've ever done in your gaming careers well we discussed this and yes, we came we to did. the conclusion that all of us are illegal immigrants to America yeah I definitely lied to go into America and said I'm not doing a journalism well though, we're not though we're writing about video games exactly I'm, I don't journalism. think anything I've ever done is, uh, yeah, is think, a journalism I think most game journalisms have done that just because of the fact that it's so difficult to get into but then it's very funny because if you're going into America you have to say that you're not a journalist mm-hmm. but if you're going to Canada you have to say you are yeah because it's complete they have polar opposite laws the fact that if you're a journalist going into America without a press visa I've got a press visa now you can't get me me too uh, me too <laughs> uh, then it, it means you're in big trouble yeah. but then if you go into Canada you don't need a press visa but if you're going there to work then you need documents because it's like they don't want to see Canadian jobs oh wow given to other people. I think mm. I always just said I was there for pleasure which was pleasure just baby true. there's that yeah. famous story of um, a plane load of um, games writers in the UK arrived at LA for um, E3 oh, they got busted didn't they and uh, a man comes on the plane and goes alright who's ready to go to E3 put your hands up if you're a writer you come here to write about E3 and all the journalists are like Woo, put their hands up they've arrived in LA and he's like okay keep your hands up do any of you have journalist visas because you're oh. all going home <laughs> yeah that was crazy that's, that's the story that 
put everyone in, put yeah. the fear in everyone and cause another decade of almost everyone I know lying. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's not even the one I heard. Like That's news to me. The one I heard was that somebody was like, oh, I'm here to cover E3. And they're like, but you don't have an I visa. It's like, but I'm a journalist. It's like, yeah, but you don't have the journalist visa. It's like, but that's ridiculous. He's a journalist. He's a journalist. Oh. And basically, oh. as a way to substantiate his own story, earned loads of his friends tickets on the same plane back home oh, as him. Jesus, why would you but do that? These, these could, That's why I know. travel alone. Yeah. Oh, these could, that, that could be entirely apocryphal, I don't know. but <laughs> I hope not. Oh my God, I've probably done other illegal things, but I can't think of any. Well, that's fun. daring, though. Like, What's the most daring? Daring. Uh... I played Far Cry 2 on hard. I talked about that on the last <laughs> podcast. That, that was exactly daring. It's pretty daring, man. It's just a bit, like, stoic, if anything. Stoic. <laughs> Very quiet, but, well... It, mm. uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, Tenno Scum <laughs> asks, if you could make a game about yourselves, what kind of game would it be? That's an easy question. It would obviously be a ridiculously self-indulgent game. Yes. <laughs> so, that's... No. Um, Patrick Reckitt I think it's his real name because it's not spelt like Reckitt Ralph it's spelt with R-E-C-K-I-T-T lots of people with great Find names what that means to I had a guy who was called like Jif uh, he was called like Jif Bang or something and I was like that's not your Jif real name Jif Bang like, and he was no I can't remember really? the name but it, was, it wasn't that when you say you had a guy no no it was a guy <laughs> Let's not talk about this. We've done the illegal question. It's not illegal. It's, uh, let's get married. Let's all get married to a man called Jif Bang. Look how clean he gets this penny. <laughs> He's fantastic at cleaning <laughs> pennies. And that's why I married him. Whatever his name was, it was an unlikely name and it was real. Mm. That's, a, that's the shittiest anecdote I've ever told. <laughs> um, your thoughts on the worst design levels slash areas in games? What are the worst... Worst, and he also says all the most surreal, which is a very different question. But all the worst, uh, so we're not allowed to answer the the get out clause of surreal. <laughs> we have to go for worst, most hateful. The water temple in the Legend of Zelda. You know they fixed that. Really? Yeah. No one enjoys the water temple. Well, no, they fixed it in um, the 3DS re re release. How? Really easy. Uh, what they did was um, the different, like you know how you have that whole section. The whole problem is the fact that you have to go underwater and then go through the different holes underwater yep. to get to different areas but it was such a fucking deep chasm mm -hmm. and because it was underwater you lost your bearings yeah all they did was just put like so above the doors they had like one door had like two red lines one door had three yellow lines one door had like four blue lines mm. so basically they just put markings yeah so as soon as they put markings on all the different entrances that you could go out of that main kind mm. of tunnel um, it was really easy because I had somebody who was like oh the water temple's not that fucking hard I did it in about an hour I was like what what and then I looked oh. at the game and I was like oh shit they've changed it oh okay uh, I also hated the great Jabba Jabba's belly in Ocarina of Time you haven't changed that it. no well why would they they're just going to re-release it on something soon it was just the bollocks of having to carry around that fish girl yeah and just slide through all those different rectums it's horrible <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, it, it did have a lot of very, uh, very anus shaped doors. Mm. I think because maybe because you said surreal, the thing that I always remember is uh, the meat circus from Psychonauts. Yeah. Maybe because that's a combination of surreal and terrible. Mm. And the fact that the whole of Psychonauts is a really good, fun game, and then the last level <laughs> is fucking bullshit. I'm just, I want to talk about a surreal level in Devil May Cry 4, which actually has the greatest art direction I've seen in games in years, by the way. Kudos to anyone who, no, not Devil May Cry 4, Devil May Cry, the new I was going to fucking reboot. say, man. Yeah. I was going to yeah. I was gonna say, do, are we going to fight? <laughs> <laughs> so no, like, like the laziest art design I've ever seen. I but, brought my demon sword. No, the, 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 nin, the ninja thing? DMC, yeah, the yeah, DMC. DMC, DMC Devil May Cry. Fantastic. It's your, but the level in that the surreal level where um, it's a cutscene and he said she's the, the woman you're with we have to break into this demon tower and Dante says how are we going to do that and she says well and it does the heist thing where it cuts to the plan and Dante is walking into a building and she says well first off you'll, you'll enter via the lobby on this floor and then you take control and loads of demons attack you so as she's walking you through the heist uh, you're playing the, the video of you heisting the building. Hmm. Except it starts going... So, also, when she marks, draws things on a chalkboard, it appears in the level. Yeah. So an arrow will guide stuff, you. Yeah. And then all this gorgeous stuff happens, starts happening. Like, she says, when you reach the 17th floor, you turn right, not left. And Dante goes, what is it now? Left. And you go left and get attacked by <laughs> shitloads loads of people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, it's just... And there's a lovely a lovely joke when it's like, whatever you do, do not get off on the 46th floor. And then you find yourself just getting off. The, yeah. <laughs> and it's like... But, uh, yeah, it's the fact that they mapped out that whole level so it like keeps flashing between so occasionally you just get glimmers of like a, a kind of blueprint version 
position of the map. Yeah, like, and it, hand it draw. flashes between. Yeah, but then that game was fucking awesome. That game was unbelievable. That game good. was one of those games that made me really lose faith in 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 just gaming and gamers and the fact that he got killed by the fact that the hardcore Devil May Cry fans hated it so much that just from the very announcement of the game they yeah. decided they hated it they decided they wanted to fail and the worst thing about that was that they hated it with such zeal and the reason they wanted it to fail was because they honestly believed and this is like fucking suicide cultist stuff this is like Kool-Aid drinking fuck wittery <laughs> in the fact that they believed that if the game failed commercially then it would naturally mean that the old style Devil May would, Cry would return as opposed to the when they hadn't the realised yeah. Uh, yeah as opposed to it just not ever coming back yeah which is just like it is stupid. Like it is just. It's there's also, nothing more to it. It's just stupid. There is no style. It's the. It is the same game. Like the combat is better than it was in DMC Four. Well, I mean the original. Yeah, but well, it, I mean the rebooted visuals. Yeah, but in terms of the characters and the way they speak, it's like they they there were in, there were really talented writers who aped the style of a badly translated game for DMC. Yeah, and and yet there are games. It's not the same thing. No, it, it really. I mean, the thing is, is, is that the, the technical fighting system in DMC Four was possibly the strongest thing about the game. It actually had an incredibly in-depth yes. technical, but it was the rest of the game was bollocks. Hmm. Like, but the problem is that the fans of DMC, like, they still think that DMC Four is the best game in the series. And I've had this argument so many times, and I actually got so much stick for simply saying that DMC Four was a, a hugely disappointing game. And so, and that's the thing is, there are two different types of Devil May Cry. People who liked it because it was like a great action game with style and fun. And people like it because it was this technical 3D uh, kind of fighting system, mm-hmm. and and like those guys, and it's like you had Bayonetta, like just fucking have that, like <laughs> it's like don't worry about it. But it's a shame because it's like uh, I, I really feel DMC was a game that would have been appreciated by people like who maybe didn't usually play that sort of game. It was the best of both worlds. Mm-hmm. I loved it. Was, it. it. It was beautiful and technical and accessible. Like it was, it would they, that that studio knocked it out of the park and it sucked. That level up. when you went into the the nightclub. And then, oh my god! Also, yeah, yeah. Oh my god! Yeah, that whole incredible. Just, yeah, the like, dance floor stripping off into just weird neon. Oh, yeah, and it's yeah, like yeah, then yeah, you're yeah, in yeah. this like level where it's like literally this pulsating like it was like um, that what's it called that that game where you're riding the waves of the oh like um, songs uh, like audio surf oh. audio surf. It was like I mean that, but not randomized it was like art direction so you had it like beautiful it was amazing when you jump off the river and you fall into the reflection and end up in the reverse world mm. uh, and of which is just the skyline but upside down so you're walking on the up, underside of bridges and all that stuff it was a blast the, you know like it, it, the art direction was the sound the story kind of obviously got a bit bollocks towards the end but just it was just a fucking blast that game it was a hell of a thing it was just such so a shame that it bombed so hard mm. because it was like and it bombed because of the fact that this, this group uh, who like dictated the the voice of fans of that genre yeah, just, just wanted shit, it to yeah. die and it's like it's literally it's like a fucking you know what they call like the aborigines like the, if you will something to die hard enough it will die <laughs> <laughs> and it's like you, you pricks well, but good news me. guys you're going to get Devil May Cry 5 and it's going to be the no you're not you've no, <laughs> no you've done you've done that you've one. killed it um, and finally um, one last question uh, this one for you for you I think Quinn's John uh, John Hilton asks, "Have you got any good ghost stories?" No, no, we have no ghost stories. This is Darth Souls. No ghosts. Max Ganache. Max Ganache. No Ganache this week, but no ghosts, so it's fine. Anyway, um, that's it for this week. Thank you very much for joining us, Johnny. Um, yes, my pleasure. And as ever, Quinns. Well, 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 not as ever. Next week we're going to have uh, because everyone's been bloody busy. That's why I got so many guests. People are bloody nightmares. Um, we're going to have next week. We're going to have uh, John Blythe. And Aoife Wilson, all things going to plan. I'm actually really looking forward to just listening and seeing what, what happens. It's it should gonna be, be great. Fun. It's it gonna should be, be fun. Then. Anyway, thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you next week. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.